Ayan, is one part of a series that UPSE and PSED are organizing for the year. The objective of the lecture series is to provide an avenue for scholars, policymakers, and industry stewards to dialogue with experts on issues of special interest to emerging and developing economies. Some of our lectures are in partnerships with other institutions such as the Ayala Corporation and the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Uh, we are fortunate this afternoon to have Dr. Albert Park, Chief Economist of the Asian Development Bank and Director General of its Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. Dr. Park is a labor and development economist with more than two decades of experience specializing in development issues such as poverty and inequality, intergenerational mobility, migration, and labor markets. Moreover, uh, Dr. Park has held several positions in the academe. At HKUST, he served as a chair professor of economics, director of the Center for Economic Policy, and founding director of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies. He is also a professor at the University of Oxford and associate professor at the University of Michigan. Currently, he is also serving as ADB's chief spokesperson on economic and development trends and leader on the production of flagship knowledge products and support for regional cooperation for uh, Dr. Park. You may begin. I can advance using this. Here's your deck. So, what's your screen and see when you're on the top Okay. Thank you for your patience. Great. Um, so, good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I was a professor or have been a professor for most of my career, so I really enjoy being able to come back to universities and talk to students. I've been at the ADB for just less than a year, and um, I understand that we have quite a lot of graduates of UP working at the ADB, um, and so the training that you get to undertake here, I think, is very important uh, training to build skills uh, that can support positive social change. And it's also very good for the ADB to have a strong training program here at uh, UP. Um, I want to talk today about frontiers of impact evaluation. And uh, I want to just say a few words about um, what I see as kind of the, front, the current trends, uh, what are the new areas in which uh, impact evaluation is moving. Um, as you all know, uh, recently several economists won the Nobel Prize for developing randomized control trials. So Esther DeFlo and Abhijit Banerjee at MIT and Michael Kramer at Harvard. And uh, that's really about impact evaluation, that they created tools that gave us uh, more confidence that we understood the impacts of specific programs or policies, and this is an incredibly important tool for development because the world is a complicated place and uh, the context in any specific country in terms of the institutions, the economic environment, uh, social structures, um, you know, they can really affect how a program uh, impacts outcomes, intended outcomes. And of course, now working at the ADB, we're paying enormous attention to trying to understand what is the best evidence to support recommending different policies and programs to member countries throughout the region. Okay, so how should I advance? Just the enter? Yes. Down. Okay, thank you. Um, so the strategy is to say a few, uh, spend some time talking about two aspects of innovation. One is about data, and the other is about thinking about the, more carefully about the connection between evaluation work and policy. 
Uh, and then I'm going to try to present some results from two evaluation studies that I've been involved in in China that illustrate some of the um, potential of these new directions. So we all know that there's been a real revolution in the availability of new types of data from online sources um, and just from better technology digitalization where lots of information gets stored and can be accessed to uh, study what's happening. And in particular, a lot of economic activity is now shifting online. And that was accelerated by the pandemic. So you have huge online platforms, um, Amazon, uh, Alibaba, Lazado, Grab, Uber, and uh, increasingly data from the platforms and also working with companies that run these platforms to kind of run experiments or try out new things. Um, because it's in a digital environment, you can pretty much capture all of the data associated with the decisions that are being made online. And this is a really important opportunity, not only just for studying uh, the impact of specific policies, but also understanding how the new online economic world can shape development outcomes. Um, and the study I'm going to present today is a collaboration between our research department at Alibaba that uh, tries to look at the impact of uh, some policies that Alibaba introduced, a green nudging policy to make, try to make consumers uh, more environmentally aware in their behavioral choices. Um, there's also a lot of new methodology that's being developed to analyze all of this uh, enormous amount of data. A lot of data is textual data, so there's a lot of new kind of machine learning methods, artificial intelligence algorithms that try to take bodies of text and quickly assess to, to kind of draw meaning from them. So if there's a bunch of news coverage, you know, you can have uh, textual analysis algorithms analyzed. Is this reflecting very positive sentiment or very negative sentiment about a certain topic or issue. And then you can start to understand how uh, citizens are reacting to new policies or programs or are reacting to new events like the pandemic. So for instance, at ADB, we have a study where we're working with Twitter, we're looking at Twitter data from the Philippines to try to understand um, how COVID-19 and and then the policies in response to COVID affected uh, sentiment of, of people in the Philippines. Uh, and of course, another area of uh, data innovation is uh, image data. Uh, so it's not just words and numbers, but images. And um, maybe the most popular application in economic research now is using satellite image data to uh, measure economic activity through nighttime light luminosity. Um, but of course, other types of satellite imagery can look at uh, land use patterns, even crop yields, and, a, and, and come up with more objective, in some sense, um, reporting of activity. And I'm sure that a lot of the events you're reading about in the news, like the floods in Pakistan, you know, you've seen the images even in news reports that can really help people understand what's happening in real time. Um, and even on social media, in addition to what you, you know, type in your text, people share pictures all the time. So I have a colleague in HKUSD where I it was my last appointment and he was coding image data to measure uh, labor protest activity in China, right? Um, and again, using these um, machine learning algorithms to do so. So it's very exciting. We can look at a lot of interesting questions that we never uh, looked at before. Um, and then the second area is about policy. And one thing that has always challenged the randomized control trial movement has been in the issue of external validity. Because I remember even Esther and Abjit, when there were only when there had only been like ten or twelve RCT studies uh, completed, it would be like you know we tried school uniforms in Kenya and we tried 
uh, cash trans conditional cash transfers in Mexico, and we tried uh, deworming in Kenya. These are some of the earlier uh, RCTs. And then people said, oh, well, what has the biggest impact on education? And the problem is a result in one country might not produce the same impact in another country because the context may, may be important. So can, at what point can we really generalize and say conditional cash tremors are in general a better policy than school uniforms or uh, teacher incentives or the variety of things that have been tried to improve outcomes? And that's still a challenge to the literature. And one example of that is, uh, uh, this recent book by John List, a professor in Chicago, called The Voltage Effect, where he's trying to understand why do some ideas spread and get implemented, whereas other ideas, you know, don't. Um, and he tells a very interesting anecdote where in the, you know, he's at University of Chicago, in the Chicago public schools, they founded their own charter school and they implemented a bunch of reforms they thought would be really innovative and really effective. And then they evaluated it, um, and they came up with very convincing evaluation results that showed, wow, this increased test score performance tremendously compared to uh, other high schools. And then they took this to the Board of Education, and they said, oh, this is so exciting. The data is so clear. You should be definitely doing this in all of the schools. And then the, the board member said, yeah, you know, we get these kind of presentations all of the time, and whenever we adopt them, they never work, right? Because, you know, you, it just worked in one school where you've been spending all your time. But if we did this in all of our schools, how do I know it would work, right? And then, you know, that was an, a, a moment of epiphany for him. And so one thing that in this book, you know, he advocates is that it's really important to replicate studies in different settings and multiple times before you're going to really get the attention of policymakers, and of course that's a little bit, that's a little bit harder for like a professor to do because you know that's a lot of money and a lot of projects to supervise if you want to prove that something works in many different settings, um, and then also for publishing academic articles sometimes it can be if you're not doing something that's really new if you're just replicating the same thing in many places maybe people aren't going to want to publish that because they feel oh the first study is interesting but the second third fourth fifth study is, is not so interesting. But for policy impact, it's extremely important. And I actually believe that places like the Asian Development Bank, World Bank, places that can mobilize funding and have uh, connections in multiple countries, this is something that is a bit more feasible and maybe we have a comparative advantage in doing things like that. And so we need to be thinking about supporting replication uh, studies. And the other aspect of evidence-based policy making, or you know, as Liz said, policy-based evidence as opposed to evidence-based policy. What evidence do I need to impact policy? Um, another, another innovation here is to think of uh, evaluation not as a final endpoint of a project, like the project's done, then we evaluate it, and then we publish our results. Even at the beginning of a project or a policy process, if you can do some evaluations at an interim period, you know, just at the beginning, and then you can see what's working and what's not, and then you, there's still time to kind of adjust the design of the project and make it better, right? And so the, there's a development impact unit at the World Bank that is now doing quite a lot of this kind of work, where they try to build an evaluation into project implementation and redesign to make policies better. And I think that's very exciting to think about evaluation as part of a le an organizational learning algorithm. Um, so I think the, the role of randomized control trials is still really important because they give us really credible identification. And I know IPA supports this view, I guess. <laughs> uh, one of the discussions is from um, uh, NGO that specializes in impact evaluation. Uh, but I think we need to think now about how, how evidence will fit into a broader strategy of policy change and development change, uh, and to be smart and strategic about how we allocate our impact evaluation dollars, so to speak. Okay. All right, so I'm going to present uh, some results. I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so can someone tell me when I have like five minutes left? <laughs> Um, 
I want to present some results from this study with Alibaba. It's with a former colleague of mine at HQSD, Guo Jinhu, who's like a leading uh, environmental economist uh, with a specialization in China, Yasu Suwadu, who is my predecessor chief economist at ADB, and actually got me involved in this project when I, I was still at, see, I'm still listed here as HKUST. Um, and uh, what, what Alibaba did, which was very interesting, is it implemented a couple of reforms which are kind of nudges. I don't know if you're, if this is a behavioral economics term, uh, movement started by Richard Taylor and others about trying to think about how people actually make decisions and not in always a rational way but that small changes can actually influence decisions that people make. Um, and in this context it's very relevant to what we are focusing on at ADB which is climate in terms of how can nudges affect environmental behavior um, and some of the motivation for the importance of this work is that China is one of the largest plastic waste generation um, uh, sources in the world uh, and nudging is a pretty cheap way that maybe you can actually get a pretty good impact. And um, we're going to focus on the use of single-use cutlery in food delivery in China. So in China there's a very advanced uh, you know, you can order food online and it'll, it'll be delivered to you. And before, pretty much the single-use cutlery, the plastic uh, spoons, knives, forks, chopsticks, they all just got provided for free if you ordered stuff, depending on, you know, how many people they thought the order corresponded to. Um, but this actually is, can be very wasteful. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of issues related to plastic use and uh, the environment and health outcomes, which I won't go into the details here, but that's kind of the motivation. And then um, China passed a regulation that said catering and food delivery services had to stop providing single-use cutlery unless customers explicitly demanded that cutlery use. And uh, Alibaba, well, actually, government policy, they did it in a pilot in Shanghai, Beijing, and Tianjin, and then they rolled this regulation out nationally in January 2021. And the food delivery platforms had to do the same. So Elema, which is the Alibaba food delivery platform, uh, conducted uh, uh, some reforms on its platform to uh, obey this new policy, and, and we describe these changes as digital green nudges. And so you can see the timing on the right hand slide, part of the slide. Shanghai started in July 2019, Beijing May the next year, Tianjin at the very end of the year, and then nationwide in, at the beginning of 2021. And um, our evaluation strategy here is going to be to try to understand what happened in Shanghai, Beijing, and Tianjin compared to what was happening in other, other cities. So it's kind of a difference in difference uh, strategy with a very exogenous change in policy in just these major cities. Okay. So what did uh, Alibaba do? They did two things. One is that they just changed the default choice. Uh, they said no cutlery, so no uh, plastic utensils or chopsticks will be the default unless the person press, actually presses a button saying I want the, the cutlery. And the second thing is they, uh, Alibaba uh, with Ant Financial, which was the financial wing of Alibaba at the time, now they're separate companies. Uh, they were also starting a program, a green point program, where if people did environmentally positive behaviors, they would get points awarded to them in their uh, Alibaba account and then if they gained enough points, uh, they could basically pay for a tree to be planted in a watershed area in China, right? So the points led to tre real tree planting. Um, and uh, this incentivized uh, things like uh, using uh, bike sharing, you know, 
rent, you know, in, in China it used to be all of the, you could just rent bikes on the street and then ride them around and you would get points. You would get these green points. There are other things. But then they added the plastic use decision. If you forego, if you didn't order the plastic cutler, you would get these green points. So this would be another incentive. If for people who um, like the idea or are attracted by the idea of doing something good for the environment. Okay. Um, so this is just a picture on the platform of how they uh, uh, ch change the design to implement this change in default choice and the rewarding of green, green points. Okay. Now, so uh, we had a number of research questions that we worked with Alibaba to answer using their own data their, you know, from their platform. So the great thing about this kind of data is that the sample sizes are enormous. It's so much data. So we're almost guaranteed to get a very precise, significant estimate of the impact. Um, and we wanted to understand how big of an effect on the actual choice of using plastic cutlery um, was resulting from this, these changes. And we wanted to also understand whether the initial effect of the policy when it was brought out persisted over time. Or did people after a while say, oh, you know, I really, I really want that plastic cutlery, so I'm going to start, you know, changing back. Um, a third question is, was there any effect on Alibaba's business from uh, implementing this change? So did people feel it's so annoying that I have to ask for the cutler every time, I'd rather use another platform. Um, and then uh, finally, were there any differences in the types of consumers and their responsiveness to these changes? Okay. So uh, we, we uh, were given access to data on 200,000 customers in 10 cities. So we tried to pick large cities like the treatment cities, Beijing, Shanghai. Uh, Tianjin, and uh, for each individual in the data set, we were given data, monthly data on their um, uh, food delivery behavior, the number of the orders that they made, the number of orders where they uh, did not use the plastic cut or did not request the plastic cut really, and how much money they spent on the platform each month. And we had additional data on their gender, age, and we had one measure of income or socioeconomic status based on uh, an estimate of the value of the phone that they used. Okay, and then uh, we do some, we define this outcome which is the share of environmentally friendly orders, which is just the orders where they didn't ask for the single use cutlery divided by the total orders and then we can uh, run this city level regression um, where we look at the outcomes for city, each city in each month. Um, and then we can include, basically we can do a difference in difference where we control for the city fixed effects and the year by month fixed effects. And um, before I present the regression estimates using that uh, uh, regression equation, uh, this is just the raw data. This is just looking at the share of environmental friendly orders in Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin, and other cities, the control cities. And what you can see is there is a big jump up in both Beijing and Shanghai of over where before the reform, the percentage of environmentally fr friendly orders was less than 5% and then jumped up, jumped up to more than 20%. So that's giving you a sense of the magnitude. There's still quite a lot of people who, even after the change, were asking for the cutlery. That's most people. But still, by just implementing these changes on the platform, they had this very large impact. Okay. Now, if you put it into that regression framework uh, and estimate the treatment effects after the reform in the three cities, Shanghai, Beijing, and Tianjin, and then average the effects, we get an effect of a 20.1 percentage point increase in environmental friendly orders, which is 6.5 times the share of environment friendly orders before the reforms uh, began. And then if we do an event study and 
look at month by month after the treatment and also month by month before the treatment, what was the percentage of these um, environmentally friendly orders. You can see that um, it jumps up and then it declines slightly, um, but it is pretty persistent. Even uh, here, I think it goes to nine months, over nine months after uh, the start of the policy. And then when we tried to look at the business performance, um, you can see here the patterns of the uh, consumer's total spending in the three treatment cities and the control cities, and they all look very similar. Of course, one thing that's very interesting is you see he, this huge spike downward uh, related to the COVID shock, but that was true in control cities and treatment cities. And then, of course, recovered um, as people realized they needed to order online and it was safer to order online. Um, but if you look at this, eyeball this, or if you run the regressions, you find no impact on business. So there is no business cost to Alibaba from implementing this change. So that sounds good. It's kind of win-win. No business loss, but gains for the environment with less plastic use. And then again, we look um, at heterogene heterogeneity, and we find that the impacts were slightly bigger for women uh, than for men, slightly bigger for high-income people than low-income people. And this is interesting, since you guys are all young people, uh, the impacts are actually bigger for older uh, individuals compared to younger individuals. Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it seems to be a pretty big environmental benefit if you work out the points and how many trees were planted from the three cities uh, in the treatment months. Um, it probably led, we estimated it led to 177,000 trees being planted. Um, and the exciting part of this collaboration with Alibaba um, is that they were very excited by these results. They thought, oh, you know, we want everyone to know that what we're doing is good <laughs> first. Uh, but um, also, we proposed to them that we try other ways to nudge uh, consumers to see if we couldn't do better than this 20% effect, right? And there's a lot of now developed literature in behavioral economics about different ways you can nudge people by giving them some kind of uh, information treatments where they, you tell them how important the environment is before you give them the choice, or give them some kind of a social pressure where you say, oh, this, most people are doing this, uh, do you want to do it? So, they, uh, so there's uh, different ways we can, uh, we can do things um, and or try to have them pre-commit for multiple orders to not use cutlery so they can get more points. So we're talking with Alibaba different things that we can do to try to um, uh, do even better for uh, the impact of nudges and for the environment. And so that is ongoing work. Okay, the second paper, how much time do I have? Can someone tell me roughly? Oh, 20 minutes, okay, great. Okay, the other paper I wanna talk about is microfinance. And this is about thinking about external validity. And this is a paper that I worked on with a former PhD student of mine at HKOSD and a professor I've worked with for many years on issues related to poverty in China, uh, Sangwei Wang at uh, Renmin People's University. And uh, the motivation for this is that, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the microfinance as a development model, but uh, it's a model that, the most famous version of microfinance is a model that came out of Asia, right, from Bangladesh. And uh, it was actually an economic researcher named Muhammad Yunus, um, uh, who worked at a research institute, who came up with this idea to think about, he would famously walk to his office every day and pass a lot of very poor people, and he would often talk with them, and he, he, and he thought, oh, you know, I'm doing all of this uh, uh, research in my office, but actually, how can I help these people? That's really what development is about. And he felt that if they could get access to small loans, they could start their own businesses and pull themselves out of poverty, and he started a program that eventually became the Grameen Bank 
and became supported by the, um, the Bangladesh government. Um, and uh, it was a program where he gave money to groups of women with no collateral, but uh, with requirements that they have to repay a little bit every week, they have to monitor each other. If one person doesn't repay, the other people have to help repay that person. And this model seemed to be very effective because the women were starting businesses, increasing income, and the repayment rates were actually really very high. And this got a lot of attention in the, in the academic world as well, among development economists. Um, and there were a lot of early papers that suggested that there were very uh, strong positive income and consumption effects. This very famous paper by Mark Pitt and uh, Kanker in 1998. Um, uh, and there was another study in Thailand which was non-experimental about a village banking program uh, in Thailand that also found pretty strong effects. But then in 2015, uh, Actually, it was Esther and Abhiji, the Nobel, recent Nobel Prize laureates, who uh, organized uh, the publication of a set of studies, six studies in different countries around the world, based on randomized control trials. So here the idea is that this should be more reliable, in some sense, than the earlier studies, uh, which were observational studies. They were good studies, but you know, maybe they had some types of bias in terms of the treated people were not the same as the control group, et cetera. And one thing uh, that came out of this uh, symposium was that none of the six, in none of the six countries did they find statistically significant evidence of positive impacts on household incomes or consumption. So it really drew a lot of skepticism. We've been so excited about the microfinance model for so long, and now maybe we shouldn't be so confident, and maybe there are a lot of issues related to um, its ability to raise incomes. Um, so that's kind of background, and the reason why I, I present all of this before even talking about our study is that when we did an impact evaluation of a microfinance uh, program in China, we found very large positive impacts and it was using a randomized control trial. So it seems to be very different than the results of these other studies. And then so uh, the obvious question asked of us and we knew what would come is like, well, why should it work in China and not in these other countries? What's so special about China? And you must have done something wrong because none of the other studies find this, right? So that's a very interesting question. And it really gets at the heart of this external validity problem, right? You know, why does it work in some places and not in other places? Um, and even in these six studies, if you look very carefully at the findings, they are quite different in terms of the types of income that were affected by the programs. And even the programs themselves are a bit different. So it's, these are not perfect comparisons. But still, it's obviously very interesting to think about um, explaining the differences in the results. Okay, so um, some of the explanations um, that uh, were, so actually, I, I should apologize. The editors of that issue were Banerjee, Dean Carlin, who founded IPA, we're gonna have someone from IPA to discuss, and then uh, Zinman. So not, out, not, not Esther, I guess, in this uh, edit volume. Um, but some of the possible reasons for finding no effects in these six countries is that maybe there was just low take up of the program. People were offered the program but just didn't take it up. Um, or maybe they already had credit from other suppliers available so, they, so giving them new credit really didn't have a big effect. Um, it could be that they were using the loans not to raise their incomes, but to smooth their consumption or do other things that wouldn't show up in an income effect, but still would be valuable to the household. Um, sometimes when you um, uh, start a new business, uh, of course you increase the revenue from the business, but then uh, it, it means you're not doing other maybe low wage labor work and so your wage income declines even though your self-employment income increases so there's an offsetting effect. Um, 
Sometimes the way the loan product is designed may make it uh, costly to households or make the households uh, choose very, be very risk averse and choose safe projects that don't have a big income uh, return. Um, and then also, especially if you have to repay something every week, right? It may make you feel like, oh, I better do something where I can generate cash flow earlier, even though maybe a longer term project might make a lot more money. And then of course there's arguments about the design of the study that maybe the, there's spillovers from the treatment villages to the control villages, uh, which will reduce the estimated impact. So for example, what's a spillover effect? It means that I give a bunch of new credit or money into this village, people make a lot, you know, make a lot of money, but then they have relatives in these other villages and they're, they're transferring some of their money over here and these people are also raising their incomes and so the difference is actually now being underestimated, right, because of this spiller effect, right? Okay. So what about China? So I'm not gonna go into all of the details about what's going on in China, but I do wanna give a few con contextual uh, factors that may help explain why we had bigger impacts in China. Okay. The first is that in China, it's very hard for farmers in poor villages to get loans from existing banks or rural credit cooperatives. China has rural credit cooperatives, but they are kind of uh, run by the uh, local uh, state banks, um, or they're managed, and they tend to focus much more of the lending on local enterprises and less on household lending, especially small, poor households. Uh, the other thing um, about, uh, let me, okay, the only thing, other one I think, I'm gonna be selective here in the interest of time, is that um, there was one uh, poverty official in Beijing who uh, maybe had heard about some of the microfinance literature and thought that having village banking where they provide credit could be a good way to alleviate poverty. And so um, my colleague, Professor uh, Sangwei Wang, he's known in China as one of the leading experts on poverty in the country and has been always advising the government about its poverty policies and whatnot. And so he really convinced the, uh, the National Poverty uh, Office to evaluate this new village uh, banking program and to randomize, right? Which is actually impressive because it's not that easy to convince local officials in China, in my experience, <laughs> to do randomized trials. Um, and so that's the background of this study. This study is an evaluation not of a program that we invented. This is an evaluation of a village banking program that was scaled up in China, uh, led by uh, the Chinese government. And so uh, we find big income increases in both self-employment activity and wage employment, um, and a big reduction in poverty. Okay. So uh, in terms of the details of the program, uh, it was each village received a fund and then they elected a manager um, and anyone could become members and then the money, the, the group in each village could decide on how much money to lend people, at what interest rate and at what duration and then uh, they would start lending to their members who had signed up. Um, and uh, it was guided by the county government, but managed by these self-selected village committees. Um, a small participation fee, no restriction on participation, but mainly lent for household income generating activities. And so here at the bottom, if I can, <laughs> can I move this? Yeah, I can move this. Ah, very good. So it, by the end of 2011, it got scaled up to 16,000 villages in uh, 28 provinces. Okay, maybe I'll put this up here. Oh, no, it's right. Okay. No. Nope. All right. I better put it back down here. Bottom is better. Okay. Um, 
And so we did a randomized control trial in, uh, oh, thank you, that's perfect, in uh, five provinces, two counties, in, so 10 counties, and uh, in each county, if in five villages, so 50 villages, um, or in each county there were three treatment villages and two control villages, and those villages were uh, uh, randomly selected for treatment within each um, county, and then we did a household survey in um, all of the villages before the program started, and then um, I think about a year and a half after the program had been implemented. About two years later, we re-interviewed. And, um, okay, let me skip this. Uh, one thing about this is it was group lending, like Grayman model, but it was a one-year loan. There was no weekly repayment, because most people felt that was just uh, cumbersome. Uh, and the take-up rate was about 28% of households in these villages uh, who were eligible, you know, decided to participate. The repayment rate was very high. Okay. So I'm not, the, the methodology here is pretty standard. It's trying to measure the intent to treat effect. So it's measuring the effect of being, of having a program in your village. So not of actually getting a loan, but but having the possibility of getting a loan, since that was what was randomized. And, and all of those symposium studies also mainly focus on intention to treat effects. Um, I'm gonna skip all of these other, there's this kind of standard <laughs> test that you do for, to make sure that it was actually randomized, et cetera. Um, and one thing you can see here is that before the program began, um, about 13 percentage of households had access to bank loans. Um, about, you know, only 5% had access to loans for production purposes from banks, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of, because these, these loans in the program were for production to raise incomes. And so very few people had uh, loans from other banks before the program started. Um, and so the uh, uh, program increased, obviously, the production loans being borrowed. Um, and then he here is the thing. We found these pretty big impacts. In fact, the, the treatment effect on household income was 4,000 renminbi. Uh, and the baseline household income in the control groups was 8,000. So it's actually a 50% increase, which seems remarkable. Um, and if you look at the sources of income, uh, people were uh, planting more of their crops to cash crops uh, compared to before. Uh, so 0.49 more uh, mu, which is the area unit compared to uh, a baseline of 2.37 mu. So that's a pretty significant increase in cash cropping, which increased revenue and profits. Um, also, uh, some increase in um, animal husbandry activity in terms of more feed, uh, buying more feed for their uh, livestock. And then, uh, there was a big effect on labor supply, so there was a lot more. One thing that we didn't expect, and my PhD student wrote a separate job market paper um, on the impact of this program on migration, uh, thinking about the issues of whether migration is credit constrained in this part of China. And so we found there was a big effect on migration and, and employment working days by, uh, by workers in these households. Um, and you can see that if you look at the, the working days where they increased, the big increases were people who are working outside of the province. So they're basically going to coastal China to get much higher paying jobs um, than if they stayed in their poor village. Uh, and fewer people working in the home village, right? Okay. And so 17% reduction in poverty uh, from a baseline of about 45%. So all of these are in, all of these are poor villages. 
Um, and the other thing is self-assessments of their well-being. Are you happy with your life, et cetera? They all went up significantly. Um, but I want to spend some time in here. So, okay, so it all seems great for this program, but why did this work so well in China? And so the last part here is we did kind of a meta-analysis of all of these studies, right? Uh, so here we're listing the six studies that were part of this symposium volume. Our study on China is the first column. And there's a last column uh, in Thailand by Kaboski and Townsend. Uh, and, and Joe Kaboski, who I, I know pretty well, he was very happy at our results because his Thailand results also found positive income effects. And everyone was telling him, too, that your result must have a problem because all of these other RCT studies do not find effects. And so he was very happy to see that there was an RCT that did find positive effects, which gives him a better argument that his positive effects are not crazy. And in fact, there are a lot of characteristics of the environment in Thailand that are similar to the one in China, right? Um, so one thing that you'll see here, uh, there's a lot of numbers here, so uh, it'll be impossible to read through all of them, but let me just make a few points, okay? So one thing is that, what's, one thing that's interesting in the China results is that you see an impact both on self-employment and on wage employment income. And that's not gonna be true of every household, but some households are migrating and getting higher incomes and some are investing in their businesses. Um, so there's, both activities are very credit constrained. And these are places in China where not that many people are working off farm because they're poor remote villages. Even though in China's whole, there's a ton of migration, right? But not from these villages. Um, and for other, other countries, you see that oftentimes, uh, sometimes uh, a positive effect on self-employment, like in India, is offset by a decline in wage employment, right? And also Morocco, uh, which suggests that not both activities are credit constrained where there's more access to maybe, you know, uh, public employment or other employment in, in, in these other places. The other thing is that the take-up rate of 28% in China is higher than many other places where you can see the difference between the take-up in treatment and control groups is, is actually not very big in some of these places like India and Mexico. Um, the other thing that you find is that uh, the size of the loans in some of the, in China, the amount of the average loan was pretty big, 45% of uh, annual income, whereas in some of these places, it's much smaller, 22%, 6%, 20%, 3%, 15%. So that's obviously not gonna be as impactful. The other thing is only China and Thailand have this yearly ref uh, repayment frequency, not monthly or weekly. And some people argue that this monthly or weekly repayment, there's been other studies actually that do this using randomized trials that, that people tend to uh, invest in less risky projects and less re uh, lower return projects. Okay, and then the other thing is the interest rate. Some of the other, uh, okay, I have to do this again. Uh, I'll just put it up here, don't worry about it. Okay. So if you look at interest rates, and the actual interest rate in China is 9.4%, but in some of these other places, it's really much higher, 60%, 110%, 27%. And that directly affects uh, you know, the benefits you can get from, in terms of income from the loan, because you have to repay much more in these other places. Um, and then the last thing is, in China, this was a point I was making before, uh, the ratio of um, time that people allocate to employment, wage employment relative to self-employment, it's relatively low, so 0.5, uh, which means that like a third of the time is in wage employment and two thirds is in self-employment. And in a lot of these other places, uh, not everywhere, but in some places it's much higher, right? Um, so in India, a lot of people are in the wage market, in Mongolia, et cetera, okay? And a lot of our gains are from being able to migrate to a place and get a much higher wage, okay? So now, uh, okay, I'm gonna have to do this. I'm done, almost. I'm almost out of time. Am I out of time? Okay, I'm out of time. So let me conclude. Um, well, I have a little bit more in people, but uh, why do we have big effects in China? Just summarize. One is there was very little formal borrowing before the program. There was a high take-up rate. We had the one-time repayment rather than frequent repayment 
and the large increases in wage employment income, income earning, wage earnings was pretty unique to China, partly because there's exceptional demand for migrant labor in coastal China, which maybe there aren't these job opportunities in other places through migration, and they're much higher paying than wage employment locally. Migration is clearly liquidity constrained, um, and there's other data where we show that the migration impacts are even bigger when in villages that are less wealthy, right? Um, so there's a lot of evidence that supports this interpretation. And so the punchline here is that the context really does matter, right? Um, and if you say why all of these other six studies didn't find a significant impact, I think for each country the reasons might be different. Some places had little take up or a lot of banking before, some places had a pretty robust wage labor market, so when they introduced financing for self-employment activities, it crowded out the wage activity and didn't have big income effects. Other places had really high interest rates or weekly repayment, which affected the return on the projects, et cetera, right? And so uh, maybe it is, uh, uh, we almost have to be arguing, given our result, that context is very important. But I think it helps I think to think about this bigger point that external validity is a real challenge for RCTs. We really have to understand, and so now I think people really want to understand why an RCT works in a certain place, not just that it does work, right? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Park, for presenting new, the new frontiers of uh, impact evaluation and giving us fresh insight on the external validity of impact assessments and the use of innovative data. Okay. We'd like to acknowledge the participants joining remotely. We have participants tuning in on Zoom, and we also have participants upstairs. So uh, just a reminder that uh, we have an open forum segment Please feel free to ask questions after the discussions. Okay. At this point, we will hear the reactions of our distinguished discussants. Uh, allow me to introduce them. Our first discussant is Dr. Yoon Young Cho. She is a senior economist at the Social Protection and Jobs Global Practice at the World Bank. She works on issues related to labor markets and social protection in developing countries, including skills, entrepreneurship, migration, jobs, and safety nets, focusing on the poor and vulnerable. She has exten extensive experience in development work covering the Middle East and North Africa, South Asia and East Asia. In 2020, she relocated to the World Bank Manila office, where she leads the bank's engagement associated with social protection and jobs programs in the Philippines. She guides a team that supports the country's safety nets, including the flagship program, Pantawid Pamilyang Pilipina Program, or the Four Ps. She also leads the analytical activities and policy engagements on the jobs agenda that promotes more, better, and inclusive jobs. Her research has appeared in peer-reviewed journals as well as numerous World Bank publications and knowledge products. Prior to joining the World Bank as a young professional in 2008, she worked for three years at the Korea Development Institute. She received a PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2005. Our second discussant is Mr. Peter Suji. Uh, Mr. Peter Suji is the interim country director at the Innovations per for Poverty Action Philippines, and Associate Director for Business and Program Development. He oversees a diverse portfolio of rigorous impact evaluations, um, works with partners to adjust their capacity building needs, and advocates for evidence-based policymaking. Moreover, he supports the development of IPAs, Asia Pacific and Latin America programs, and works with partners to develop new research and policy projects, as well as new research initiatives. Since joining IPA in 2011, his portfolio includes projects across the fields of agriculture, social protection, migration and remittances, nutrition, and government governance, 
uh, with government, NGOs, and private sector partners. Previously, Peter worked for the International Labor Organization as an impact evaluation specialist and helped develop monitoring systems for a community development financial institution serving poor minority populations in the U.S. He has a BA in Economics and International Studies from DePaul University and an MSc in Development Studies from the London School of Economics. Um, may I call on Dr. Yoon? Magandang hapon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to provide comments to Dr. Park's uh, fascinating lecture. Since uh, I was asked to provide comments about his lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about impact evaluation in general, and then I will go over some of reactions to this, uh, his papers, uh, the two papers that are really fascinating. So uh, let me start with uh, preaching to the choir how important it is to have rigorous evidence to really provide uh, evidence-based policy making to the government. So when Dr. Park mentioned the importance of impact evaluation and impacting that rigorous evidence uh, on the policy making, he mentioned Mexico's progress. Uh, but in fact, the Philippines is also another country that has implemented certain experiments, rigorously evaluated, and based on the findings, the government scaled up the intervention. I'm talking about Pantawit Pamilyang Filipino program. In fact, I came from the Department of Social Welfare Development in the morning, uh, the meetings, and then I came directly to UP uh, School of Economics just now. So Pantawit Pamilyang Filipino program, as you may be uh, familiar with, it started as a World Bank pilot project in 2006, 2007. And at that time, the randomized control trial was conducted, and the impact evaluation really boosted the government confidence about the impact of this conditional cash transfer. The health, nutrition, education, and behavior changes through family development sessions have really impacted the households, poor and vulnerable households, to invest in their children's human capital. That evidence strongly provided the uh, confidence to the government. So throughout the time, it became the nationwide program, and it scaled up through the you know every municipalities in the country. So right now, it is serving as a very important human capital strategy and poverty reduction strategy of the government of the Philippines. So as a World Bank, uh, we take pride not only as a financing bank, but also knowledge bank. And we promote rigorous impact evaluation in our loan project. And building on evaluation, we inform the policy making. So the Pantawid Pamilang Filipino program is a very good example that it started as a pilot project, built on the rigorous impact evaluation, scaled up, and government even proceeded even further that it institutionalized the program through Four Peace Act in 2019. In 2019, Four Peace Act not only institutionalized the program itself, the law actually specifies that impact evaluation should be conducted every three to four years, and it's going to be done by PIDS. This is another good example that it started as a development partners initiative and intervention and global expertise in evaluation, but eventually when it is being scaled up, it was really observed by local research institutes. Your own Dr. Babes, Dr. Abrigo are the champions of impact evaluation of four piece in PIDS, and the tradition continues. So this is not only the four piece program. You may be heard. Uh, you may heard about the Kalaisid community driven project and other initiatives of the World Bank. We are taking the similar approach. So the World Bank has a dedicated uh, unit of DIME Development Impact Evaluation Group. Not only DIME Group, but also you know some of the economists like myself who are working on the loan project also work on some of the initiatives and uh, interesting areas for rigorous impact evaluation and really inform the evidence-based policy making. 
So I'd like to re-highlight that uh, it is very important to have this impact evaluation and have it as part of regular program and regular practice. And uh, we heard that you know, NEDA and you know, UP School of Economics are taking the leadership in really mainstreaming impact evaluation practice. And we have good partners like IPA, ADB, and 3IE very active in uh, the Philippines. So continue to do the good work and uh, be the champion of impact evaluations. Um, that's one thing I wanted to mention. And going to the, the fascinating study about the green nudge in China, it is really interesting to hear about um, uh, the nudge and the power of default. So before coming to the Philippines, I used to live in Washington, D.C., working at the World Bank headquarters. And one thing the U.S. government requires the World Bank people to do is we need to do, renew our driver's license every year. And driver's license uh, can be renewed in the DMV, Department of Motor Vehicle. It's worse than LTO, I can guarantee you. <laughs> you have to wait long line and wait forever. And we need to renew the driver's license every year. But the end of, at the end of the long line and long waiting, I always have to check the box, do you want to be an organ donor or not? And when you get an accident, so when you're unconscious, you automatically donate your organs or not. And then I keep thinking, should, should I do that or not? Can I, can I trust those people? What if they mistakenly thought that I died and then they decide to donate my organ while I'm still alive? I had to like, think hard about it. So, that's, so I, it turns out that I was not the only one who is thinking hard about whether to donate their organs or not. So the rate of organ uh, donate is very, very low in the US. But if you think about other countries in Austria or France, 99% of people are actually donating organs in the driver's license. And people started looking at what's happening. Are they better people than us? <laughs> Why they are donating more organs than us? It turns out it is the power of default. So because in Austria or in France or in Belgium, organ donation is the default option. And if you don't want to do that, then you have to opt out. But in the US, it was the opposite. If you want to donate, you need to opt in. But people have difficulty in making decisions. So there are three aspects of the power of default. One is the default option somehow looks like that's the correct answer. The policymakers or government, whoever smart may have made a decision on default, so that must be good answer. So it suggests kind of good kind of social behavior and norms. So that's the first thing. The default option may be the good one. And second one, making decisions takes you know, your mental energy. You have to think hard whether to donate or not or whether to make, you know, how many decisions are we making in everyday life? And it is taking the toll, so you don't want to make the decisions. So default, if you are already, if you, somebody has already made a decision for you, then that's good. And third one, if there is certain status quo, changing the status quo is really actually taking a lot of effort. So having the right default option is actually very powerful policy tool. So in the green nudge, having the, you know, the plastic utensil, not having the plastic utensils as a default option is actually very powerful tool for policy, uh, encouraging uh, desired social behavior. We need to just think hard, what could be other examples that make default as a social policy? In Germany, they made um, green energy, so the, choosing the energy source from you know, environmentally friendly source of energy like wind or you know, solar panel, that is default option. If you want to choose some other option, you have to make decisions or you have to change the status quo. So there must be other options that can make the default option as a social policy itself. We need to think hard and we need to look around more. 
this is kind of the behavior economics aspect, and behavior economics aspect is also very fascinating because I know that my brain is very lazy, you know, making decisions and digesting information and reading and, you know, processing information is uh, taxing. So behavior economics is all about making your processing very, very easy uh, because, it, you know, it recognizes that, you know, the, your brain is tired all the time. So during the pandemic, what we did at the World Bank is working with the Department of Health to fight against the vaccine hesitancy. So it turns out that in the Philippines, vaccine hesitancy was very high in the beginning of the you know, vaccine distribution. In the beginning of the vaccine distribution, if you remember, only um, Sinovac or some Chinese brands were available in the country. It was before Pfizer or before Moderna. And you know, people didn't really want to get vaccines. Maybe they remember the dengue vaccine kind of uh, incidents. So vaccine hesitancy was very high in the country. And we wanted to really fight against the vaccine hesitancy. And the Department of Health worked a lot to fight the vaccine hesitancy. So they produced very fancy, elaborate table with the columns, Pfizer, Moderna, Sinovac, Sinopharm, all the vaccine brands, even Russian vaccine brands, efficacy rate, number of doses you need to have, intervals that you need to have. So it was a lot of information and then my eyes and my brain is telling me no more information. So how do you fight against this vaccine hesitancy without overloading information to busy people in everyday lives? And what we thought that, you know, giving very simplified information about the vaccine acceptance can be really effective. We did a survey experiment and giving them information about a very simple message. What if Pope says that it is important? Would you be willing to get vaccinated? What if Miss Evangelista, the celebrity, tells you that it is important? Would you be interested in getting this vaccine? What if simply you want to get together as a family during Christmas? We know that Christmas is a big event in the country and you really want to get together as a family. You know, would you be willing to get vaccinated? So we wanted to digest the information and give some nuts to people. So it is, of course, survey experiment. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it may or may not have impact on actual vaccination. But survey research shows that they are actually changing their uh, perception about vaccine hesitancy and they are more willing to get vaccinated when they heard this simplified, very familiar messages rather than the tables. So here comes the importance of utilizing simplified messaging and behavior economics into your policy making. The third uh, uh, aspect, microfinance paper, I'm very glad that you found a very big, strong impact. I remember 2008, I joined the World Bank, and the World Bank hosted a uh, big event with Dr. Yunus. Dr. Yunus came, Grameen Bank, Nobel Prize, and he was signing his book, and we thought that microfinance is going to be the panacea for the poverty reduction. And then 2015, <laughs> Dr. Park presented the paper, the RCT, six studies, and it shows disappointing results. In 2015, I started working in Bangladesh, and Dr. Yunus was, in fact, at the time, was involved in some political scandal that he challenged the government, and government is criticizing you, Grameen Bank, Money Shark, and, you know, microfinance is not working. So, you know, our expectation and hope for poverty reduction through microfinance came from here to here. But now you provided very good evidence on, you know, big impact on the incomes, especially migration to other areas for, you know, wage employment and self-employment through uh, animal husbandry and other activities is really encouraging. But then the question is, again, why it worked in China? Why it can, can it be replicated in other parts of the world? And a few questions arise. What about the group versus individual loans that people have been talking about? You know, you made a loan for a group of people, 
rather than individuals? Would the same set of work for the individuals as well? That could be another question. And the second question is, you know, microfinance, when uh, Grameen Bank was born, it was really a very small amount without collateral. And, you know, people are working together as a kind of trusted group and they are providing the accountability and they have to frequently repay and then the current repayment is actual guarantee for the next loan. But if it is going to uh, be like one-time lump sum payment rather than frequent repayment, is it sustainable? Because you know, the loan providers are going to be concerned whether these people will repay or not without collector. Uh, but anyway, uh, regardless, uh, finding this big impact on income and economic activities is fantastic and hope that other parts of the world can also replicate this exercise. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yoon. Uh, Mr. Sorji, now have the floor. So I'd like to start out by first thanking the UP School of Economics for organizing this, this excellent event. Um, I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be invited as a discussant, uh, as part of the panel, um, responding to this, this very interesting and uh, relevant evaluations that Dr. Park uh, presented us, uh, to us today. Uh, I'm going to be, try to be brief with my comments and focus on um, the, the two elements that um, Dr. Park opened up with in terms of the use of big data and impact evaluation, and also this question of external validity. Um, but first, uh, I'd like to just briefly introduce Innovations for Poverty Action. Um, so Innovations for Poverty Action, we are a uh, research and policy nonprofit, uh, an international uh, NGO, uh, based out of the U.S., and we have 21 country offices um, across the world. Uh, and we have an office here in the Philippines, in Ortigas. Uh, we're actually the, the oldest office. We started in uh, 2003, and we've conducted 60 impact evaluations uh, with government partners, um, with other NGOs, and the private sector um, in the country. And uh, in terms of our, our mission, we, it, uh, there's essentially three pillars involved in our work. So the first pillar is generating rigorous evidence on the cost effectiveness of development programs. Uh, and we do that uh, not exclusively, but we're known for doing that uh, through the use of randomized control trials, uh, which are really the best way to identify the causal impact of a program uh, when feasible. Um, so we're applying essentially the same rigor uh, that's used to test the efficacy of the vaccines uh, that we've all been taking during the pandemic, and we apply them to social programs. But we don't just do research for the sake of research. So our second pillar is actually sharing that evidence strategically uh, with policymakers and decision makers that need that evidence to inform their programs. But again, it's not just as simple as saying, this is the evidence, use it to inform your programs. You can see through the presentation uh, on the microcredit study and comparing that with the, the various microcredit studies that have been conducted uh, across the world, it can be difficult for, for policymakers to digest and, and use that evidence to actually form their programs. So our third pillar is really uh, working with our partners to equip them to use evidence um, to inform their decision making, their programs and their policies. Um, in the Philippines actually, uh, the majority of our partners, not exclusively, but the majority have been with government departments, which I think is actually uh, an indication of how serious the government has been uh, in terms of rigorously evaluating programs and using those programs, that, that evidence to, to inform their programs. So um, we've been actually working uh, with DSWD as well, uh, the Deaf Ed, uh, DOLE, the Supreme Court, the Department of Agrarian Reform, uh, many government agencies uh, in evaluating their programs. Some of these partnerships have lasted um, over a decade, actually, working with them to, to evaluate their programs. 
Um, now, we do advocate for evidence-based policymaking. We do advocate for conducting impact evaluations and randomized controlled trials so we could understand what impact our programs are having and the lives that we're, we're trying to actually impact. Um, but whenever we actually present our work, when we do capacity building workshops, when we do impact evaluation workshops, we don't want people to walk away thinking that um, I have to do an RCT of like every single program that's out there. It's not feasible, uh, it's not wise. <laughs> uh, there's, there's certain contexts in which it is useful to do randomized controlled trials, and so we, we always try to um, uh, make that point. Uh, and one of the considerations, um, among many, is that impact evaluations actually, um, they're costly. Um, they can be costly because uh, collecting data can be costly, especially if you're running a program that's affecting poor marginalized communities. Um, it, costs data, it costs money to actually go to those communities and collect data directly from those households. Um, and so we're actually, and so you need to consider the cost versus actually the benefit of, of doing this evaluation. Um, so many times when we, we run randomized control trials, um, not all the time, but one obvious example is um, we'll do an evaluation of a flagship program, right? So the World Bank has been doing RCTs of a four-piece, for example. Um, uh, we, we've done evaluations of uh, DS, uh, sorry, Dole's um, livelihood program uh, to reduce child labor in the country. Um, they're large, big bud budget evaluations that have been kind of been running for such a long time, but actually many times the, the government says, we actually have no idea what impact we're having on the beneficiaries that we're trying to serve. And so that's what, that's what we need to know so we can know how to improve the program. Um, and, and I'll get to this a little bit later, but I, I also just wanna make this point that um, impact evaluation, and Dr. Park was getting at this as well, we don't use impact evaluation as a validation exercise. We don't do it to say, okay, thumbs up or thumbs down. Your program works, your program doesn't. We, we come at it from a, from a perspective of uh, we want to learn. We want to learn how our programs are working and not just to what extent they're working, but how they're working, why they're working. And by answering those questions, we can know how to improve. Um, so where does big data come into this, right? So this is kind of uh, mentioned as, you know, one of the frontiers in impact evaluation. I think one area where big data can come in, and I think um, the, the Green Nudges study is a good example of this, is that when you, when you have big data available to you, it reduces the cost of the evaluation, right? Um, if that data is already avail available, uh, it's not too difficult to get access to that data, so that's, that's an assumption we're making there. Um, and, uh, and it's relatively clean. Uh, we can actually run impact evaluations at a much lower cost versus you know, going to every individual household and asking them what choice did they make and why. Um, also the timeliness um, of impact evaluations. So by using big, big data that might already be available, we could perhaps run impact evaluations uh, more quickly, which could be more, give uh, more timely evidence to policymakers uh, for decision making. Um, now, I want to say that you know this isn't a given. Uh, there's there's a lot of considerations, particularly also with timeliness, uh, because one of the big factors uh, is also that you know impact evaluations can take time because depending on the program that you're evaluating, um, uh, you need to kind of allow for some time for the impacts to be realized. So for example, I think Dr. Park said they waited one or two years uh, until they actually ran the end line surveys to determine the impacts of the, the microcredit program. Uh, so it's not the only factor, but if you're using big data that's readily available, um, it can help shorten the timeline of the impact evaluation, uh, which can be important for policymakers because um, many times you know, they don't necessarily have three or four years to, to wait for results. Um, another thing, and this has definitely become apparent during the pandemic, is that uh, big data can be really useful in situations where uh, it's very difficult to collect data. So in emergency situations like a pandemic, you might not be able to actually uh, go collect household data. Um, and 
Uh, one example of this actually is um, during the pandemic, the government of Togo was running a cash transfer program, or they wanted to run a cash transfer program. Um, and it was a digital cash transfer program. Um, and they actually didn't know how to locate, like, who are the households that we have to reach. So how do we actually target these households? We don't have, like, the data readily available. Um, and so we actually worked with the government and uh, NPI Josh Blumenstock from UC Berkeley um, to actually develop a way to figure out a targeting mechanism uh, to try to make sure that the households that were at most need uh, received those crash transfers because the, the government of Togo didn't have enough money to have like a universal program, right? So it had to be a targeted uh, program. And so what we did was uh, we used satellite data and I'm, I'm going to oversimplify this a little bit. Uh, but we used uh, satellite imagery to identify poor villages. So based, basically, uh, based on kind of the level of infrastructure that we saw, um, you know, where there uh, paved roads, uh, did the houses have roofs, things like that, uh, to identify poor villages. And then to identify the poor households, uh, we actually used uh, cell phone data. And the idea there is that typically poor households are gonna top up their phones more frequently with small amounts of money uh, versus wealthier households that will, um, uh, you know, they might just top up on a monthly basis, you know, they might have a postpaid plan, uh, things like that. So we're able to actually target poorer households through that cell phone data. Um, and that's actually the targeting mechanism that was used to reach those households in the pandemic. So that's another example uh, where big data can be used, especially where uh, access to, um, uh, you know, collecting data just isn't possible, right, in an emergency situation like that. Um, so I think there's, it's really exciting right now, kind of the use of big data. Um, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation actually tried to map out all the studies that are using big data right now. And I think actually Dr. Park's study is, is quite novel because there actually haven't been so many impact evaluations that have been really using big data. So when they mapped it out, they found that impact evaluations were kind of the minority of the studies that are using big data. And so there's actually a lot more room for us to, to think about how we can use big data um, in impact evaluations. That said, I think there are some considerations of kind of the limitations of, of using big data as well. Um, and I think one thing is kind of the types of data that we can collect, especially, so at IPA, our, um, our kind of mission statement, let's say, is, is more evidence, less poverty. So we're, we're explicitly trying to reduce poverty. And so many times we're, we're evaluating programs that are focused on the most poor, marginalized communities that, you know, actually aren't well connected. Um, when it comes to even having cell phone signal, uh, access to the internet. Uh, and so when it comes to big data, it can be difficult to actually get data on these, these households that you know, are trying to be reached. Um, and so I think, um, at least you know, for the near future, um, household data collection is still going to be really important um, in terms of evalu um, uh, yeah, evaluating programs that are trying to reach uh, these households. Um, another thing is that, uh, you know, using big data and kind of big data alone in evaluations um, works when you have a very short kind of simple theory of change. But when you have big complicated programs that have longer theories of change, where you want to measure kind of each step in the theory of change, um, you're probably not only going to use big data. So it might be a combination of using big data, some administrative data, and, and household level data that you've collected yourself. Um, so I, I just want to kind of make the point that there definitely is a role and a growing role for big data impact evaluation, um, but it's not sort of the, the end goal to use big data um, for all evaluations, and you know, that's the only type of data uh, that we'll use. It's, it's another source of data. Um, that we can use in impact evaluation. Um, and maybe just to give one quick example, so uh, we did a study in Uganda on uh, payments for ecosystem services program uh, that was essentially trying to get uh, landowners um, to 
uh, reduce deforestation. Um, and essentially, what you do is you essentially pay landowners to, to not clear trees from their land. Um, and in order to look at the outcomes on, on deforestation, uh, we actually looked at, we used commercial satellites uh, to get satellite imagery and uh, GPS data to understand what was the tree coverage uh, for each uh, plot of land for the landowners that were part of the study. And that way we could easily measure kind of what were the changes uh, in uh, tree coverage uh, due to the program. So that's another way that, um, that uh, big data has been used. In, in impact evaluation. And in this um, kind of map that the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation did, they found actually that the most common types of big data that have been used in impact evaluation are really satellite data and uh, cell phone data. Um, now when it comes to external validity, um, so I've been doing this for a while, <laughs> and um, I think almost every time either I or a colleague or anyone else presents an impact evaluation, there's almost always someone in the audience that brings up the external validity question, right? So, okay, well that program worked there, but what about everywhere else? And I think it's, it's both an easy question and a very challenging question. It's an easy question because, well, of course, just because it worked in one place, doesn't mean we can make a blanket statement that it's gonna work exactly the same everywhere else, right? But it's a challenging question as well because then it's, you know, it raises a host of questions then of like, well, under what conditions can it work somewhere else? Because really, decision, -making, decision makers, policy makers want to know, okay, well, how do I use this evidence to actually inform my own policy making and program making? Um, and, and many times, I think working with, with partners, um, there's this perception that if something works kind of geographically close to you, it's more relevant um, than something that, that happens like further away. So for example, like for the Philippines, if there's evidence in Indonesia, for some reason that's more relevant than evidence in Ghana. Um, and I really wanna challenge that type of thinking today because I think that's the wrong type of thinking. Um, and so, um, we have a sister organization, uh, JPAL. So some of you may know about JPAL. It's the uh, Jamal Abdul Latif Poverty Action Lab, uh, based out of MIT. Uh, they're almost kind of literally our sister organization because uh, one of the founders of JPAL is uh, sisters with our executive director, uh, Annie Duflo and Esther Duflo. Um, and um, one of the, the co-directors of uh, j Pell actually co-authored uh, this article on what she calls the generalizable, generalizability framework. Uh, so that's Rachel Glenister. And the, the point of the generalizability framework is that it gives a systematic way to assess um, how evidence of programs that worked in one context, context how can we apply it to another context? Um, and I think what's, what's really key is the word context, right? So that's something that Dr. Part kept saying and, and pointing out, that the context matters. It matters a lot when we talk about impact evaluation. Um, so some questions when you're, you're thinking about general, generalizability is not, you know, how close was that program geographically to us, right? Um, but, you know, was that program actually addressing a similar program, uh, problem that I'm trying to address. Um, and, and why did that program work? And I, I really like how, how Dr. Park was kind of comparing the results of the different microcredit studies because it starts getting at the questions of, okay, well, why does it work in this context versus another context? So those are the questions we need to be asking ourselves um, so that we can try to apply evidence from one context to another context. Now, um, whenever we do impact evaluation workshops, we always say that the place to start when you're designing a program, when you're going to evaluate a program, you start with a theory of change. And it's no different when it comes to applying evidence to another context. You want to start with a theory of change. So you want to start with the, the causal pathway by which you expect your program 
to affect change. So I think some of you might already be familiar with the theory of change. Um, it's you know how you conceive your your inputs to translate to outputs. So that it's related to the implementation of the program, and then how you expect outputs to translate to, to outcomes and the ultimate impact. So those are the, the things, the behaviors that you're trying to change. Um, and when you, you spell out your theory of change, there are certain assumptions that you have to make. There are certain external conditions that have to hold in order for your theory of change to really work. And those assumptions, explicating those assumptions is really key when you try to think through, okay, well, that program worked in this context. Can it work in another context? So you need to think about those assumptions that say, okay, well, this program worked in China, and these are the, all the assumptions that we made um, in order for the program to work. Now, let's look at that theory of change and all those assumptions, and let's see, would those assumptions actually hold in the Philippine context, right? And, and by... Uh, validating those assumptions, you know, might require actually looking at existing studies. You might actually have to collect some descriptive data uh, to better understand to what extent would it hold in the Philippines and to what extent might you need to actually adapt the program um, if you think it's even relevant. Um, and, and so the theory of change is the place to start. Um, and I would say that there's three main things that you want to think about when you're applying um, research from one context to another. And one is the, the local conditions. So as I said, is it addressing the same problem, the same needs? So you do a needs assessment, it's always the start of you know, starting a program. Um, and, and like Dr. Park said in China, uh, the clients were very credit constrained and there was a demand for credit. Is it the same in your context, for example? Um, you also wanna think through kind of the, the general lessons that we've learned from, from existing evidence, right? And is there actually some sort of um, proof of concept already on, on kind of the theory of change and the mechanism by which you expect to, to realize that change? Um, and that's where really kind of looking at the assumptions is really important. Um, so the last thing is local implementation. Um, and, and local implementation in the program itself. So for example, okay, over, let's say in Uganda, we implemented a program uh, and it was implemented by an NGO. If we implement that program in the Philippines, but the government implements it, can we expect the same level of implementation fidelity? Uh, can, we, can we expect um, implementation to work exactly the same? Or do we need to modify things a bit? Um, also, when it comes to, to microcredit, um, thinking about the product itself. Um, so in, in China, you know, the, the repayment schedule um, wasn't as onerous in other areas, right? So it was just, they had to repay once a year. Um, so thinking about if you wanted to apply this evidence to the Philippine context, looking at the um, existing microcredit products that are here, um, you want to look at the, the actual product itself and say, okay, can we expect the same? Uh, with repayment rates that are, uh, let's say, monthly, for example. Um, so it's, there's a lot of work that goes behind actually identifying uh, whether evidence from one context will work in another context. And I'll, I'll quickly end with just one quick example. Um, so there's been one uh, kind of program that's shown to be effective in a lot of different countries, and we call it Teach at the Right Level. So essentially, there's a common problem uh, in the Philippines, in many countries, uh, where you have students that are falling behind in reading and math scores. So they might be in grade six, but they read at a second or third grade level. It's a very common problem. Um, and the problem is that you know, teachers have such large class sizes that they can't actually teach to everyone's individual levels. They just teach at the grade level. So if I actually can only read at a second grade level in sixth grade, and they're teaching at a sixth grade level, I'm probably not gonna be learning so much. And so the program essentially, uh, there's different forms of it, but one common form is basically a remedial education program where you have you know, an hour a day with a, a tutor or another teacher or volunteer, and they teach at your actual level. So they kind of calibrate the level of teaching based on what is your existing, uh, your existing math skills, your existing reading skills. Um, and this type of program has been seen to be super effective 
uh, in many contexts and countries. So in Kenya, in India, in, in Ghana, <coughs> um, in, in many countries, even in the US. So actually they use the findings, and I really like this, they use the findings that were um, from a, a study in Ghana, applied it to a program in Chicago, evaluated that program in Chicago and found it to be effective as well. Um, and actually now, so my colleagues, uh, Isha here and Jetboy, who are both um, alumni from the UP School of Economics, uh, are just actually finishing a mobile education program that we're doing with the Department of Education. Uh, and it does have a teach at the right level component to it. Um, and they're still finalizing the report, so I, I can't say the exact results just yet. But um, uh, I will let you know that actually by adapting that to the Philippines and evaluating it, we've actually found it to be very effective as well. Um, so uh, I just want to end when we, uh, to talk, when we talk about external validity, um, always think about the theory of change, uh, which helps you kind of unlock why a program works. And um, if we can understand why a program works, then it's, it's easier for us to kind of uh, apply evidence from one context to another context. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soji. Now at this stage, we will be entertaining questions and comments from our participants. I'll turn over the mic to our research director, Dr. Renata Reside, who will moderate the open forum. Thank you very much, Pad. Um, uh, at this time, we will have our open forum, and uh, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Park, uh, Dr. Yoon, and Mr. Shruji for, for sharing uh, their experiences no, and their knowledge. No? And uh, so I'm Professor Reside. I'm the, the research director at the School of Economics, and uh, this is the start of our open forum. And um, our practice is to get questions first uh, uh, from the on-site audience. So if you, if you are on-site, so you're here, uh, go to the nearest microphone, uh, stand, uh, microphone stand uh, to your row and wait uh, for your turn to ask a question. No? So, um, so uh, people are welcome to go to the mic and ask questions if you have. And uh, I will direct the, uh, the relevant questions to, to the panel. All right, does anyone have a question? In the on-site panel? Okay, don't be ashamed. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I'd like, uh, first, it's a, let me just comment, no? Uh, it's, I think uh, this has been a very helpful discussion and uh, maybe I will I'll comment First, no, in general, about the 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 way the panel has uh, uh, covered the topic no, on impact evaluation. No? Uh, so, we're basically, we will wait for someone, but I'll comment also. No? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the panel for an excellent uh, and very uh, uh, enlightening discussion on uh, impact evaluation. No? So, they they presented. Uh, it, to my mind, uh, they've made very convincing um, um, arguments for greater evidence-based uh, evaluation no? in, uh, in uh, government policy. And so, um, so from a broad perspective, uh, I think many of the quantitative uh, tools that you're learning at the school, so I'm addressing the students here, uh, are, are potentially very important because they, they will help you later on. Uh, as you can see, the econometric tools are, are available to you for uh, evaluating uh, uh, different kinds of policies. No? Uh, and so in the Philippines, uh, speaking from my own experience um, uh, with, with policy makers, so I've seen a lot of uh, use for evidence-based uh, policy uh, work, no? uh, whether it's in evaluating programs or even 
uh, legislation. No? So legislation, uh, I uh, worked with, with legislators in, in the recent past, and uh, there's a lot of uh, need for, for that, no? uh, to, to have reforms in our country in the area of, uh, say, even uh, taxation uh, and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, legislation. No? Um, the other thing is that uh, they, uh, Dr. Park uh, 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 mentioned, and, and also Mr. Shruji uh, mentioned about uh, big data, and that's certainly uh, one of the frontiers. No? Uh, we're, we're certainly getting uh, a lot of uh, potentially useful uh, access uh, to, to data that can be mined for important information. No? So that's, that's very good for people who have quantitative skills. And then uh, lastly, uh, Dr. Park brought up uh, uh, the nudge from behavioral economics. And again, that's another field that's becoming uh, very important uh, right now. No? And uh, there also are potential applications uh, in program, in the design of uh, programs. No? Uh, uh, speaking of talking about the nudge and other aspects of behavioral economics. So I think I see uh, Professor Arleli uh, uh, at the mic. Yes. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the speakers. You know, this is a very interesting discussion. Um, I'm really struck by the methods, the innovations, especially the use of big data. Um, but I would also echo the point of uh, Peter here where um, it assumes a certain characteristic of the participant, right? Where uh, some of us would not have access to the internet where the big data would be, uh, can be sourced. And so it opens, uh, I think, follow through with a lot of methodological uh, techniques and tricks that you would need to use for the analysis. So uh, just like, uh, and there's also another issue which is um, sort of relevant to us right now, and that is the issue of data privacy. No, I mean, um, right now, uh, you're saying that cell phone data and also um, data from transactions are the ones that are, have potential to be used for policy. But then it could run counter to like, you know, data privacy issues. So I'd like to have a sense of, um, you know, what are some of the things that can be, you know, uh, put into place to protect uh, the privacy of the, uh, the transactions and the individuals. But at the same time, you know, have that data be useful for policy analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kraft. Um, I, I, I'm not sure who in the panel would want to answer, but uh, I, personally I was struck, I, I wanted to ask the same question actually. My question was for Dr. Park actually, uh, because he worked with Alibaba and I wanted to know basically what kind of uh, data access agreements or protocols you had with them. So. That, that would be in line with what uh, Professor Kraft also uh, asked. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the privacy issues are, are, are really important, have to be discussed quite a lot when we collaborate uh, with really any organization that's providing data to us. And oftentimes, um, uh, we come up with arrangements where we actually never ask for identifying information uh, and usually now the companies themselves also care a lot about data privacy because if if something happens they can get in a lot of trouble or get very bad publicity and so uh, for Alibaba we don't actually get the data we work with them so it requires that they have people who can handle the data and uh, I think they provide us some remote access where we can access the data in a secure way and do analysis, but we can't really take any results out. We have to get all of the collaboration from, from the Alibaba. And then in addition to that, uh, we work with them to actually analyze the data. Then when we produce results, we also have an agreement that, you know, they need to approve kind of 
that the results are accurate. I mean, not that I, I like the results or don't like the results, but uh, they, can, they need to kind of clear it internally themselves to make sure there's no questions about um, how the data was used. Um, so you need to be careful both about um, the privacy issues and then also uh, if you're collaborating with someone to make sure that you're very confident that the analysis has been done correctly. And I've been involved in other projects, including with the World Bank, where this has become an issue where some result gets produced and then someone hears about it and then there's a lot of scrutiny on whether it was, uh, whether it was accurate you know, and what are all the assumptions, the analysis, especially if it's a sensitive, uh, sensitive result. Um, and I, you know, I was, uh, we're, we have a big data initiative or a in data innovation initiative in our research department and we're trying to work with statistical offices in some of our, uh, in some of the countries in the region. And I was just in uh, Georgia in the Caucasus because the statistics office there has been very um, open and very collaborative. But then we were trying to access mobile, uh, well, telecommunications data, not just mobile phone, where, you know, the, geo, the, um, uh, the GPS data on location, but also every call by every person. So you know, and the phone numbers and the country where the phone was, you know, so quite a lot of data potentially to look at issues of um, labor mobility in the country and the impact of COVID, et cetera. And there was huge concern by the telecom main telecom company about. And so we're still, so Geostat was working with the telecom company to get the data to, to work on some analysis and we're supporting them to use this data to come up with some newer, more informative indicators about labor mobility in the country. And we also have some research questions that we think also might be interesting. Uh, but it's, it's kind of gotten stuck a little bit because the telecom company is very, very cautious. And so there's lots of discussion about how can we support collaboration, but still really maintain strict privacy. So I think it's a concern that um, everyone is now very, very aware of. Yeah. Well, you mentioned a while ago that uh, ADB was working with uh, Twitter uh, in the Philippines, and then how did, how did that, uh, can you describe well, what the data is? I think the Twitter data that you, anyone can get, I believe. That's, I can double check that if, if someone thinks that's not true. <laughs> it's just why we use, uh, I'm not sure what the nature of our contract is with them. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, there's a, the lady. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure, hi, good afternoon. My name is Pam. I used to work in policy reform, but now I'm doing grad studies in rural sociology. Oops. Rural sociology, so completely not an economist here. Um, but my question is actually about the microfinance study. Um, with regards to the focus on context. I mean, would World Bank produce this EODB index years prior? So I wonder if good governance or misgovernance or objectively any kind of governance plays a role in how microfinance projects are positively, uh, are impact, their impacts are whether positive or negative. If that has been a factor in the studies. Well, I mean, in our study, it's a, uh, well, there, there's many ways to think about governance, right? There's a lot of literature and development about how uh, local governance arrangements can really affect the impact of government programs, especially the distributional consequences of programs. So I've done a previous study actually with the World Bank on uh, evaluating China's they had a poverty, a village poverty investment program that they did in many poor villages. And then we found that some of the characteristics of the governance of the village really affected the, uh, whether the richer or the poorer households benefited from the program. Like, it actually turned out, uh, surprisingly perhaps, that if the village leader was more educated, uh, it would actually, he tended, the, the projects would generally help the poor, poorer house households in that village than if the village leader was less educated. But also just general governance indicators. If the, gov if the local village committee was, uh, was active and had larger memberships and were inclusive, then you tended to see bigger impacts uh, for both rich and poor households, just as an example. In the microfinance context, it's, 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 this is a classic uh, concern because 
the program established a new governance uh, body, right? It, it had this self-selected management groups to manage the village funds. But you have to think in reality, that village already has a governance system with strong leaders, a village committee, and then, then you wonder, well, how is that governance structure going to interact with this new governance structure that's being created by the project to some extent? Because it's certainly not going to be in a vacuum, and there's certainly going to be interaction. And then it could even be that some of the local village leaders become managers also of the... Um, and that's why you always are concerned that any program could get co-opted or controlled by local powerful people. And there's a lot of very good development economists who have focused on these kinds of uh, issues and thinking about decentralized program or even community-based programs, which generally are viewed as good governance programs, but not necessarily if, they're, if a community governance program is co-opted by some local elites who are not always interested in the board. So, I mean, we, we didn't really get into that. And one thing we would like to do in this uh, data is also get a better sense about whether, about the distributional impacts. Were, were poor households benefiting more than rich? I mean, there were poor villages, so they're all relatively poor in a China context, but within the village, there still could be differences about who's getting in and who are the leaders of these things. And so you could study these governance um, uh, impacts, but we haven't had, uh, we have some data limitations to do that, and we have, haven't gotten around to doing it. So, but I think it's an interesting question. Uh, yes, the the gen. Okay, you have a follow up question. I, I think no, I just wanted to mention because you mentioned the EODD. I don't know what kind of uh, EODD um, uh, procedures you have in mind, but in ease of doing business, if. I don't know the context of the China, but you know, if you think about the Philippines, if you want to do certain transactions, can you imagine the amount of paperwork that you have to do? And you have to repay every week or every month, and all the paperwork for borrowing very small amount of pesos, then you know, it's certainly not going to work, <laughs> even without evaluation, I can say. So maybe introducing very simplified, streamlined, and simple uh, procedure for taking the loans and you know, making even repayment easier and then making the, you know, accountability group through village leaders or village cooperatives, you know, that could certainly work in the context of the Philippines. I just want to mention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the gentleman. Yeah. Good afternoon. I am Benito from the UPD Demand Information Office. I would like to ask questions regarding impact evaluation and data gathering. How, how do you verify that the data you gathered are factual or truthful? Just like in 4 piece which now has a call for looking into the data of the beneficiaries so that we will know that those who are beneficiaries should be the real beneficiaries and not modus beneficiaries or those close to the community officials. So how do you know that the data being given by the beneficiaries are true. And regarding the repayment system, maybe it's one of the cultures, if I may say, of Filipinos that it's difficult for some Filipinos to save money for a long period of time because there will be always cases wherein they need to get that earning or that uh, money they save and use it for other purpose. So maybe that's the reason why repayment in Philippines, especially as I can see in our villages, repayments are more frequent, just like the five six. If you know what I mean, the five six of the the five uh, loan sharks, as they may say, because it will be difficult to save that amount of money for a month. And once you return, no, oh, I'm sorry, I've used it for another purpose. So maybe there's also a way to how to look into the culture of the beneficiaries. Thank you. I think it's a great question on, on data quality and it's something that we, we think about all the time. Um, so, so at IPA, we have um, a set of uh, what we call minimum must-dos to try to guarantee the quality of the data that we collect. Um, and I won't go into to all of them, 
Um, but, but one of them is that all of our surveys, for all of our surveys, we conduct audits. Um, so we have an auditor who's separate from the, the data collection team who will revisit a random selection of households and um, they'll ask uh, a selection, the same questions that were asked in the original survey, they'll ask a selection of those questions again uh, to the same household and then we'll compare the, any differences, any discrepancies between the original survey and the audit survey. Um, and, and we do that for a variety of reasons. So one is also to make sure that the, the enumerator that conducted the interview didn't falsify any information. So they didn't just you know, sit at home and actually make up the data and then submit it, right? So that's one thing that we want to check for. Um, but we also include a, a number of questions to check um, you know, the, the stability of uh, some of the, the, the answers um, that we're getting uh, from the respondents themselves. Um, and they should usually be things, you know, that uh, shouldn't change, right? Um, and then we look for discrepancies between those things. And if we do see any patterns there, then we look into that and try to, to rectify it. And, and we conduct these audits throughout the survey itself and run the discrepancy checks throughout the survey and then do any course corrections as, as needed. So that's, that's one example of how we try to uh, quality assure the data. Um, another thing is that we're always very careful to separate ourselves from the implementers themselves. So when we actually go to interview households and let's say we're evaluating a program of DSWD or DOLE, we don't actually say, you know, we're, implement we're evaluating this specific program that you're benefiting from, that DOLE is implementing, uh, because we don't want them to, one, we don't want them to like get the impression that we are the implementing partner um, or that their specific answers are going to be relayed to the partner because that might introduce um, uh, a level of social desirability bias, right? So they might actually respond in the way that they think that implementing partner wants them to respond. Uh, and we want to, we don't want that, right? So we want to try to collect as objective as data as possible on, on the, the outcomes of that, that program. Um, and so we always introduce ourselves as, as IPA and we're conducting research. Um, and our hope is that, you know, by kind of separating ourselves from the implementing partner, we can get around some of those issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other maybe, questions? Maybe I can add just a couple of things on data quality. And then the, well, the second question was, uh, what was your second question? I, I forgot. After the second our... question is regarding uh, the repayment structure. We're in, maybe you can look into the culture of the people. Oh, oh right. Okay, good. So, um, so on the data quality, uh, in addition to, uh, you know, there are a lot of things you do in survey work to try to, well, one thing I always do is if I really, if it's something we really think people are, are not going to report honestly, we just don't ask it because we feel <laughs> it's not going to work. Like it, in, in China, if you ask someone how much money do you have in the bank, they're just not going to tell you. They all, almost all will say zero or not just in China. Yeah, so, uh, but the other thing is if it's something you think they can, they're, they're not going to report honestly, you can come up with ways to, to uh, check it in other ways. Like I was, when I did my PhD, I was, doing, I was trying to measure people's grain storage, farmers' grain storage on farm, and then you know, it's hard for farmers themselves to even estimate how much. They have this full in a bunch of strange containers. And so we said, oh, it's very important that we get this accurate. So we actually asked them to allow us to go into their grain stores. And we actually measured all of their containers. So then we, and we knew what crop, and we could just get a much more accurate um, version. And even that, they were a little bit nervous because they, you know, didn't, they don't want their neighbors to know how much grain they have. But we kind of just said, oh, we want, you know, this is for science, for research purposes. So that, that, that helped quite a lot. Um, the other thing is, you know, it, one thing about lying, it's, it's hard to lie a lot because you'll eventually say stuff that is not, not consistent with itself, right? Yes. And so we do a lot of training of, of enumerators on co internal consistency checks that, you know, if they say they spent some time working on this, then they better tell you that they had income from that or other things. If, so that to try to catch them to make sure that it's a, it's a coherent story that they're telling you. So that's another way to, to maybe check that. And sometimes they're just forgetting, you know, not they're actually trying to mislead you. Um, 
But anyway, those are some other thoughts. On the, on the, on the question about repayment frequency, you're right. There's definitely, um, I think, evidence and some research, um, both theoretical and I think empirical, that suggests that a weekly repayment helps to discipline um, the repayer to kind of keep making the repayment. And it's kind of like a, it's like a commitment device, a savings commitment device. And also, oftentimes repayment is in a group meeting, so you have to come in front of all of your neighbors and repay in front of them. So it's kind of very embarrassing <laughs> if you don't come and repay. So that gives you kind of another kind of a social sanction that will make you feel disciplined. And sometimes it's actually really, really not, not, not good for the individuals themselves. You know, there was a, I visited a microfinance program in China and there was a woman who had been really uh, felt excluded from the village life and she was given a loan uh, to buy a cow and she was so happy not just because she got an asset but that she was part of the group and the community and it was kind of included and then but then she had no other income source so she said there's there's no way she's not going to repay that weekly payment right because it's so important to her to be and so she would like starve herself or not even you know not not buy salt for her food because she wanted that money for the repayment so you can see that there's a kind of a double-edged nature of that, but it's definitely part of the logic of weekly repayment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think uh, Professor Kraft has another question. Thank you, sorry. Um, um, I have a question regarding external validity um, and the role of meta-analysis. I know that there are, there are so many um, impact evaluations already conducted on, you know, almost sim on similar interventions. And I was just thinking, what would be, and, and in some instances, it's feasible to actually conduct a meta-analysis similar to what they do in medicine where, you know, if they do an impact uh, efficacy of trials on a, on a drug and they do it in different countries, then it's really possible to do a meta-analysis. Uh, what is its role, let's say, in, 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 in you know, saying that, that a particular intervention has external validity? You know, if you can get you know, all of these um, independent impact evaluations of similar or nearly similar interventions, have you encountered, does it really solve the external validity problem? Or does it contribute to, you know, um, in your experience, does it make it easier? <laughs> the fact that there have been many uh, impact evaluations already conducted. Um, well, my initial reaction is, uh, well, the more evaluations, the better. I mean, you just have more information. And so you feel, if you have certain different ideas about why certain things work or don't, you, if you have more context, more cases, you can probably think through the evidence. But one of the challenges, and I am actually was just talking uh, this morning about a meta-analysis we're trying to do on learning loss recovery uh, studies. And um, one of the difficulties, though, is that you're going to see different types of programs, and then this one works a lot, which is probably good. But then some others maybe work half the time, or 30% of the time, or 70% of the time. And then I think it's a little bit harder to interpret those because it could be that it just certain types of you know, you know, circumstances it works and certain doesn't. So it's not that it doesn't work. So for any one place, it could be that one that has a lower success rate will be more effective, right, than one that has a higher success rate. Because it's, again, about, I think the, the, this, uh, you know, uh, focus on theory of change, I think is a really good way to think about it. It's very, uh, I think, helpful. And so even when you're looking at uh, a literature review, um, so if, it, if it's someone's already just done a meta-analysis and written it up, and then you're uh, in some context and you want to know what can I learn from this from my own place, it may be difficult if the data is not presented in a way that helps you think about your own theory of change and the relevance. So, but of course it would be good. You can look at those studies and go read them yourselves and then reorganize them in a way that maybe can test, you know, whether you think that the places that are similar to my place are actually places where it was, where it was 
just, it requires more work, so it's just it's not simple. But I think generally speaking, meta analysis is uh, really good, but it should be done in a way that can give some again um, some insight into why certain things work and when, and why other things don't work and, and when. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, we'd like to uh, field a question from our online audience. Uh, the question will be flashed on this screen, so uh, we'll wait for it. Very high tech here. Uh, okay, uh, there is a question. Uh, from who is this? Who is asking the question? Oh, this is from uh, our friend, uh, Gabby Domingo. He's, he's abroad right now, and therefore he's online. Uh, his question is, regarding nudges, have there been examples of nudges with a high take-up? It was mentioned that only 20% of total orders change. If there are only few, why should we advocate for nudges instead of regulation, which is a sort of legally enforced nudges? Wouldn't regulation be more effective in terms of actual behavior change? Um, well, this was a regulation that was a nudge. I'm not sure that it's right to distinguish between nudges and regulations because a regulation is it's just. But this question of, um, I think when you're saying regulation in this context, you're saying should we just like uh, make the decision for them <laughs> as opposed to change the default because otherwise it's just not going to be effective enough. Like saying everyone has to be an organ donor <laughs> or nobody can get plastic utensils. Uh, and I think probably uh, in most contexts that will be resisted as being uh, too restrictive, right? Um, uh, so I think, I think the nudges are really helpful. And you can say 20% is a small impact, but I think 20% is quite a big impact because it's basically a free uh, change. Not as big as the organ donor difference between the US and, and uh, Europe maybe. So it will, I think it will of course differ for the different types of nudges. And sometimes, um, even if it's costly, uh, you know, there's a lot of literature in development too that small, small fees can make a big difference, uh, either good or bad actually, in how people think about it. If, sometimes if they pay a little bit, they value the product more, this is the bed net stuff, right? Um, and so uh, they actually are more likely to use something if they paid something themselves, so it actually can be beneficial in some ways to charge, or, or a, a small cost can may, in other contexts, may you know, keep them from doing something that you think is, is not a good behavior. And so even, there's, even though there's a cost attached to a rule, it's still, given its effect, given its impacts, it can, it can be well worth the, worth the cost. All right, um, thank you very much. Uh, We'd, uh, we'd like to express uh, our thanks to our panel, uh, Dr. Park, Dr. Yoon, Mr. Uh, Suji. And uh, uh, so please give them a round of applause. And uh, I think uh, we have closing statements uh, here. My, my eyes are... Yeah, um, so we have, uh, we do have uh, closing statements and uh, oh, from the EMC, okay. Hello, thank you everyone, thanks for sticking. Uh, that ends another insightful discussion and we hope to see you again for another fruitful afternoon. Uh, of course, we appreciate receiving feedback and so we've set up an exit survey. You may scan the QR code, we have a QR code, okay. You may scan the QR code on the screen or uh, you can find one at the registration table. Uh, we've also prepared refreshments at the back. So I uh, hope you enjoy and uh, again, thank you and good afternoon.